Um, hello, Mike. Uh, I'm Ian. The, my, the first thing I wanted to ask you is ridiculously simple, so I'll give you a couple of questions. The first, first of all, you mentioned that Cummings said you should have a science DARPA, was it? I didn't know what that meant. Yeah. But, okay. but when you when you've sorted me out on that, as a general question, if I had been a Brexiter, I would have been pleased that we left, but then tried to be as close as possible to the EU. I'd also be nice to remain as. Um, so you have studied people's behaviour, I believe. I mean, would you care to comment on why this government has been so single minded about we must almost pretend the EU and Europe doesn't exist in some respects. OK, so um, DARPA is the American Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Um, its name alternates with um, ARPA, Advanced Research Projects Agency, which, which takes a lot of the um, military edge off. It, it was DARPA originally. Um, and what it was, was um, a lot of government funding into tech developments. It's, it's helped develop things like um, uh, Apple touchscreens. Um, and uh, I think Google got an initial uh, grant from um, ARPA. So a lot of technology where America has gotten ahead um, has been supported at early stages by this big national grant, which was very much focused on easily making money available for uh, creative science and tech going on in the States. Okay. Um, the other question you asked, which is why have a lot of the, the, the Brexiteers um, on leaving not sought to build a new close relationship with the EU, but rather pull as far away as possible, even if it's economically damaging, it's because they fear, um, and they will state it as such, they fear being pulled back into the EU's orbit. <clears throat> they know if we start working with the EU, that's 27 other countries um, that, that sets rules and standards, and we could just say, oh yeah, <clears throat> 20 other countries that are advanced democracies start setting standards, they're probably good standards, yeah, we'll go along with that. And then suddenly, everything that they believe in in their rebellious nature that Britain can do things dramatically differently from the rest of Europe because we think differently and we're more creative and more innovative and nimble. Um, the closer we get to the EU, the more we will be dulled and slowed down and made to do things their way. They, they actually want to put this massive fire break between the UK and the EU so that we uh, can be different and remain free to be different and in order to help that they want quick partnerships with the US and with Asia in order to to um, throw their grappling hooks to other places in the planet to pull us away from Europe so that we start thinking and behaving differently uh, from Europe that's why that's philosophically why that's useful it's good to know one's opponent I suppose um, a question rather different that I've got here. Somebody called Andy Anscombe asks, is, uh, this is off to Ukraine to some extent, is yeah. the new possibility of fast tracking Ukraine and Moldova for EU membership, giving hope to UK scientists for a possible swifter return should domestic circumstances favor? Um, I, you would probably agree that this dreadful business in Ukraine is changing the perspective of Europe to some extent. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, it's it's changed the perspective of Europe dramatically and overnight. Um, I was I was absolutely delighted to see the EU moving at ten times the speed of the UK um, on uh, sanctioning oligarchs, taking measures about no-fly zones, shutting down Russia today and, and Sputnik. Not because I. I don't believe in, in free speech. I don't care what people say, let them all have a say. But, but these institutions are actually part of the Russian government. They're actually physically part of the Russian government and everything to, should be just cut out, right? 
Um, and the EU has been moving on that incredibly fast with the refugee policy. You know, over two dozen countries, 27 countries, that's 10, 27 countries can get their act together um, within the first, you know, uh, 100 days of war with that refugee policy, which is EU wide. And then leaving Boris Johnson and Priti Patel flat footed, mean spirited, making tweaks around family issues, right? The EU moved incredibly fast um, on that, as it did with the, with the no-fly zone, as it did with those media sanctions, <coughs> as it is now with um, confiscating um, uh, yachts and so forth and so on, um, and sanctioning lists of oligarchs that, that the, the UK still hasn't got anywhere near touching. So um, because of this pivot, um, and you see this new strength in the EU, and it is leading, it's really, I mean, Biden is, is now on a backseat. It, it, it's the EU that is supplying the weaponry, leading on sanctions, leading on, on seizures. You, you know, you've got statements coming out of the US saying now that we will do the same as the EU, right? Um, it's been an absolute turnaround in terms of resolve, in terms of the spirit of Europe, in terms of the whole purpose of what the EU was about, that peace project that buffers for peace. It's a big team that helps each other. You're seeing that left, right and centre. And that's why uh, the Ukraine wants in and it wants in fast. And the EU was saying, let's get this process started. I mean, obviously, we've got big problems, but you have just demonstrated the spirit of Europe. And that's why you've got Moldova now as well and Kosovo saying, me too, me too, because they see that. And you've got um, Finland and Sweden, already EU members, that said, God, maybe we should be in NATO. And that's what kicked off the Russians with, with some of their ridiculous threats against those countries. But people now um, are re-evaluating very quickly uh, the, the sheer value of NATO and the EU for the preservation um, of Europe and uh, Western values. And so we're absolutely at the battlefront of that. Yes, of course we feel it in the UK too. Of course, I mean, I feel it and I know all of you must feel it. Of course we feel that. I mean, we always knew that our vote to remain wasn't about, you know, the what's in it for us dynamics of, you know, you know, how far does our money go for us in this? It was, it was always about the peace project, the collective, the exchange of people, the, 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 the common security, the partnership and humanity being built on collaboration more than competition. All of those values you now see really viscerally coming to the fore. So, of course, it's part of the UK commentary now that we're not part of the team, are we? And we're behind the team and we're not being more nimble than the team, are we? It, it's becoming clear. So, yeah, of course, I mean, I want us to rejoin. I know, of course, that uh, the EU will be in no hurry for us to rejoin if they're looking at, you know, three potential new members that, that fully appreciate the EU that much more than maybe the UK does at the moment. And I know for pretty much sure that we're not going to be welcomed back into the EU if one of our main political parties is viciously against it. Um, that's a problem because the EU will not want us playing the hokey-cokey with EU membership. We're in, we're out, we're in and out. We're, we're renegotiating and shaking it all about, wasting their time. So it's absolutely critical if we do want to firstly build closer, you know, maybe there are new structures that, that, that can be uh, built around the single market or how we do things in Europe. It doesn't matter, but, but, but that, that, that fundamental understanding of working together, shared decision making, that's what we need to, to build on. And the way really to do that, to remove obstacles to do that, is to cause a change within the Conservative Party. The Labour Party will already be there, SNP already there, Lib Dems already there, Plaid already there, um, Reform Party, forget them. Um, but um, 
it really is going to be a big battle in the in the Conservative Party coming up over the next um, decade. Um, I, and and bit by bit, we have to you know chip away at those at those toxic dinosaurs that want us not even to get close to the EU. The David Frosts, the the Bill Cashers, the 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 Edward Lees you know, the, the Jacob Rees Moggs and um, Steve Bakers that um, have this visceral fear of us even collaborating and working with partners on our continent and adopting similar standards. Um, the more we can sideline those people and at least just work with our European neighbors, the more we can have sensible and open discussions about what should the structure of, of, of European cooperation be? Because you can break it down into different areas of uh, uh, science and, and markets and security and exchange of people. You know, some of those overlap and they get trickier, but there's, there's a lot where you can have different levels and overlaps with it. And so um, I think because we're seeing at the moment with, as you said, that the horror of Putin's attack on Ukraine, um, it's all change in everyone's minds and everyone's approach to this. It really is all change. And, and that is why uh, Volodymyr Zelensky is a brilliant politician because he knows with, the, with these dramatic moves, with you know, him, stay, him taking it on, he can just throw that demand at the European Commission, put us on the, the pathway to membership and who can say no to it? because the times are so messed up. You know, he's got part of his country that has been taken, Crimea that has been taken by Russia. That's an absolute disqualification for EU membership. But who's gonna say no now, given these new and strange dynamics? And that's why Moldova is changing tack. That's why Switzerland, you know, that has neutrality as a grumpy, grumpy religion, um, decided to implement the full set of sanctions that the EU are. And the European EU sanctions are hardcore. And Switzerland isn't just doing token stuff. It's saying, for all intents and purposes, we're an EU country now in terms of how we're behaving on these sanctions. So it is all change. And everything is possible now because the world dynamics have just flipped rapidly. Yes, Putin has unified people in a surprising way and a good yep. way. Um, just changing subject for a moment, Sarah Molliver asks, does the UK have access to and contribute to the European reference networks? Is that something you know about? Oh, such a good question. I believe that we don't, um, which is frustrating. Um, I, I asked that question of people in the Commission and they didn't know. Um, and then someone got back to me and said, well, actually at the moment, no. So the European Reference Networks um, essentially is the rare disease um, networks. And the way it works is, let's say you've got a, a child in the UK with um, some really rare disease that their GP doesn't know what it is and their local hospital doesn't know what it is. Um, but then someone, after a couple of years, after having done lots of tests, says, aha, it's probably this. And the leading expert on this um, lives in or works in, in Florence, Italy. And so you then get connected through to that expert. There's, there's funds associated with keeping this network alive, but also part of the network is um, about the patients um, and patient communities built around these rare diseases. So it's a common database of all these different rare diseases where, where um, people can go on them, they can see the experts across Europe, but then you also build the communities of the patients who are similar sufferers. That's what that is. And my, my last check-in, and I, and I took various checks on this, but at my last check-in, I heard that actually we weren't in this. And I have to, that's really well reminded, and I'm going to make a note here, I have to get back to um, some of the UK uh, rare disease um, people and actually check um, where we are with that now. 
thanks for that superb question because that's very very important and now oh, Mark... i will also say this related to that that the european medicines agency has a fund for orphan drug development and orphan drugs are drugs that would usually not be profitable um so they just don't get developed and they're not profitable because they're associated with rare diseases so they need extra public financial input in order to make them viable to at least develop um and so by not being in the single market medicines and and um with the body of the ema we don't have access to those funds to help develop those rare disease drugs Thank you. Thank you, um, Mike. Um, somebody called Mark Johnston asks, do you expect UK ever to join Horizon? I know you were talking about them. In other words, can dispute over trade in goods with Ireland first be tested? Does that make sense to you? Yes. Um, this is, as I was saying before, this is one of the places where you would say logically yes of course why not it's in everyone's benefit but being in the strange universe we're in now i'm really really not sure and the the factor in here is boris johnson's selfishness i think the real hold up here is that boris johnson wants to remain in power he will throw anything under the bus in order to remain in, in power. The ERG have him by the balls and know that they do. And therefore, Boris Johnson would quite likely blow up something on the Northern Irish Protocol to then just try and bluff and bluster it away, having satisfied the ERG that he's done the full Brexit that they wanted. And so as a hero of purism, but more practically, manages to stay on in power until all, until all of this resolves it will resolve it will resolve we'll find a way well i i will not think about it and other people will find a way that's what i think the biggest danger is there and i think the only thing keeping that in check is that <laughs> just um, so a lot of the country would go absolutely mental about that uh, the, the us would go absolutely mental about the complete betrayal of that within the Western partnerships if he were to do that. And it would probably mean actually sanctions from the US as well. But would the US put sanctions on when the state we're, we're in with Russia? It really is a, a delicately balanced system, which explains why nothing has happened on the Northern Ireland Protocol because of all of those dynamics. So we just carry on in limbo on that. Okay, yeah, next. Right. Um, Andy Sanderson asks, if there have been any tangible advantages of Brexit to British science, roughly how do they stack up in percentage terms against the measurable damage caused by Brexit to British science? In fact, have there been any tangible and significant advantages, advantages at all so far? And are there ever likely to be any? So, the only potential um, advantages in science uh, would be in areas like GMO, if you think that the UK needs to catch up on GMO technologies because they haven't really damaged health uh, much. Um, and in artificial intelligence um, and in some other areas of regulation. However, uh, with GMO, it's quite it's a lot more complicated than just you know gmos being banned in europe because what gmos are we going to develop in the uk i mean we we don't really need gmos in order to be able to feed ourselves in the uk or in or europe um we've got decent climates for for pretty much most of the things we grow with some crops maybe it adds a little bit of benefit just an ease of growth but sometimes there are downsides so it's not a big one now there are issues of developing um gmo plants for example for growth in in um 
difficult conditions such as Africa. And those that are in favor of it will, will often argue for, you know, say, look at the example of, of golden rice, where you can put vitamins in it that, that save blindness in kids because you're putting in the right vitamins. Well, that proof of technology hasn't been fully developed yet and used effectively. But furthermore, um, golden rice was developed in a German university. I mean, you could do the research here. It's just about where you can go and sell it. So I'm, I'm struggling here to help the Brexiteers to try and come across, you know, something. Um, I need to go back to some AI people that I've talked to before to ask them about whether there is any potential benefit of, of our own regulation in the domain of artificial intelligence. The last time I checked in uh, with a, a professor who was running, I think, three multi-million uh, projects in AI that were all EU-based was the answer is absolutely no, because what you want is massive processing power and you get that by bigger budgets, the kind of budgets you have on a multinational level with other countries. Um, and then you develop the cutting edge stuff um, and that's where it's at. So I've tried, I've tried many times to try and think of advantages here, including the UK being able to be a bit of a, a regulatory sandbox in collaboration with the EU. Um, but I find it very hard to, 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 to think of any real, certainly not, none have come forward so far. One from me, um, Remain was favoured by younger people, better yep. educated people and female people. Can we make any deductions from that? Um, yes. Um, but I, I think we all I think we all know the demographic lay of the land as it was during the Brexit referendum and broadly why that was. Um, with older generations, um, there's I think there's often a factor of you see the world changing around you and it's not what it used to be. And those factors that have caused that change and that alienation can well be quite stressful to you. Um, and so the notion of having more control in order to make it more like it was before, um, of course, has appeal. Um, for those that are, well, not just better educated, but more internationally connected, it's easier to see the advantage of the international travel and international collaboration. And you feel naturally more kinship with people from other countries as well. If you've been at university and you've had Erasmus programs there and know people from all these other countries and so you know um, so you know people in other countries not on a I go there for my holidays level but kind of like I have work and collaborations there that, that all that all makes a difference. Um, I think what that means going forward is um, what we're seeing already in the polls whereby um, Remain has been a more popular option than Brexit, you know, if the referendum were to be held again. We've seen that crossover happen in the polling in about 2018, and it's been stably like that all the way through and slightly opening up a bit. At the same time that you've got Brexiteers, only about 7% have shifted to the other side, and with Remainers, only about five or six percent have shifted to the other side. Those that have voted before are largely bunkered in, but the new generations coming through are largely remain, and those that didn't vote and haven't wedded themselves to either side have stayed largely remain. Um, and so I think that that is, is, for the most part, that demographic change is just going to, to, to slowly glacially be opening up that change over time. Um, thank you. I think that connects to some extent with asking you if you think Starmer is handling his role as well as he might. Would you do it differently if you were leader of the opposition? Right. Um, this has changed over time. 
um, I was a big fan of Starmer when he came in um, because I thought that um, he had the right pitch and the right look and clearly a good brain on him. Um, you know, he was Sir Keir Starmer, QC, nicely swept hair, acceptable to um, uh, mild conservatives and had that kind of background that, that gives an indication of authority. Also, his pitch to the Labour Party was that he could unite um, the differing tribes of the Labour Party because he was essentially himself um, a socialist, um, but also could appeal uh, more broadly than, than Corbyn could. And so he won the leadership hands down uh, and did that well. The first thing he did was absolutely go hard on anti-Semitism, which was great. Um, he also put in um, uh, articles in The Telegraph, for example, and I thought that was a good move because that really changed dynamics and his popularity was ahead of Boris Johnson's pretty quickly. I then think that um, he lost momentum, um, I, that was accidental, um, but, but he lost um, that, that juice and fire that he had towards the end of his first year because he wasn't putting out any program and initiative about what his party was about now. What is Starmerism? What does it stand for? What is the soul of it? What would he do about COVID? What would he do with the Brexit situation? What would he do on, you know, on security and investments in our communities? You know, none of that was coming forward with any fire. He just seemed as though he'd done a lot of sort of like the, 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 the cleaning up and detoxifying, but then couldn't make that gear shift onto the front foot. And then that's when, uh, then a few months later, he started slipping behind Boris Johnson in the polls and people started wondering about whether he was too dull, you know, and I thought that he was just like a frustrating piece of wood. Um, I think over time he has, he has gotten better. I think he's always performed well in PMQs. I think that he clearly does have a bit of ruthless ambition for power and is uh prepared to cause upsets with his own part within his own party for it but he had also handled that really really badly and had been over aggressive early on in terms of him actually breaking promises to to listen to a lot of people uh within labor so i think the long i think his early long-term game was bad because he didn't set out his stall and he was just waiting for Boris Johnson to mess up and he, and he caused aggro within the Labour Party between left and right that he didn't need to cause. I think he's in a much better position now and I think he's looking more solid now. Um, I think the way he's playing Brexit is right. Um, and to be honest, I wouldn't want Keir Starmer championing uh, a return to Europe or rejoin at the moment. I, I wouldn't want that dynamic. I think that dynamic would be toxic for us. I think this is our mission to do as the pro-European community, as our different pro-European uh, campaigns, grassroots for Europe, European movement, all of that. This is for us to do right around the country, local community by local community, on social media, building the arguments, pushing for it, being constantly, you know, under the radar and nudging it, I think if Keir Starmer were to align with that, then the Conservatives would easily fall back into this thing of, oh, he doesn't accept where we are, oh, he's a remake, and it would just snap people back into the trenches they were in before. I think by Boris Johnson and Keir Starmer both saying, let's find the opportunities of Brexit and make the most of Brexit, it frustrates half the damn country who are like what opportunities of Brexit this is all bullcrap it gets all that frustration going and that's frustration that we should be harnessing at a grassroots level much like as we went into the referendum debate with the Labour Party for Remain the Conservative leadership for Remain and all the other mainstream parties apart from UKIP for Remain um, and it didn't work 
did it because it's not about the alignment of political parties. It is about the mood in the public and the frustrations in the public and how these arguments play out in the different sectors and communities and demographics of the public. So to, to a large degree, um, I'm very glad that, that Keir Starmer is completely off that. And at this stage where I think it's actually completely on us to own that initiative and drive that initiative so it's in our court because we understand it. I think if the Labour Party were to try and do it and have it fit their agenda, it, 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 wouldn't, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't be natural to them. It would be fake. And there's nothing like fake remain in order to put people off it uh, or fake rejoin in order to put people off it. What Keir Starmer needs to do is build, rebuild with the, the red wall and that the working class issues of uh, cost of living, um, of community building, of people gutting them out versus their, their quality of life, their quality of food, their quality of community, quality of education being guaranteed, their pride of place being guaranteed by people who actually care. That's what he's got to gun hard on. And the Lib Dems have got to gun hard in the rural community, say, you know why we were for Remain? Because of British European farming standards, British European food standards, um, quality of water, quality of air around here. We wanted all the European guarantees on that because that's what the healthy rural life is about. Look at what these Tories are doing. They're having all of that ripped up. That's where Labour should be and that's where the Lib Dems should be. And that pincer movement on the red wall and rural blue walls is what will do it while we within the pro-European community should be setting up citadels everywhere and building those local communities everywhere. So communities that weren't on board before from, from farming communities to fishing communities, to ex mining communities, to um, uh, care communities, what have you, strong representation in all of those for all of the values that we hold dear. Um, that's how I think it needs to be structured going forward. That's very interesting and I agree. Um, some uh, Mark Johnston, who asked another question, he says here, you said you met Dominic Cummings. How do you rate him? That's always good for a few words. Um, he was very good to me. Um, we got chatting at the beginning of the referendum debate because um, I think he'd been in a in a debate with uh, Will Straw, who was the head of the Remain campaign very early on. And Will Straw said some particularly stupid things. I can't remember what. So I um, I DM'd him, I think, um, because he was following me or, or something and, and said, yeah, that was a pretty stupid take. Uh, I don't agree with that because da da da. And we, we struck up a conversation. Um, and he sent me one of his early videos that I don't think ever saw the light of day um, about uh, what Brexit would do for UK science because of uh, this famous scientist of the past and this famous scientist. And it was a really nicely slicked down video. And I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, very nice. Uh, and then he, he wanted to meet up to discuss things. And I said, okay, but on the understanding that we're not going to debate about whether Brexit is good or bad for science, but rather how we can use this referendum debate to ensure that we're all championing science per se and its importance in the discussion. And I was saying that because I knew that 90% of scientists were pro-EU and so I wanted more scientist voices agreed on. Well, then he didn't get back to me on that. Um, and so then, and then we sort of drifted um, but then after the, the referendum, I, I, I contacted him again and said, you know, should we meet up and chat things through? I think there, there's damage it, that, that could happen. And I've got, you know, proposals that I'd like you to look at. And so um, we, we met up in London somewhere. He turned up on his bike. We sat down at this little cafe and um, he wanted to chat a lot about some of the idiots on his side. He said, David Davis. Um, he said he was lazy as a toad. All he ever did was go for boozy long lunches with Nigel Farage and Aaron Banks. He was useless, he said. 
Um, he also sprung me his citizens DARPA idea. We discussed, you know, where the potential damage could be to science. He told me that he that Boris Johnson was actually very worried about what Brexit would do to science. And I said, well, can I send through some suggestions then? He said, absolutely, yeah, do that. Um, but he also said, but of course it'll be all right because um, the, the, the 350 million uh, will mean that we've got plenty of extra money for science. And I thought, whoa, I, th I thought you were, I didn't say this to him, but I was, I was stunned by that because I thought that he was a really bright guy that knew that that was a bullshit line. And of course, the costs of the whole Brexit process and, and rebuilding, uh, reinventing the wheel would completely consume all of that. But he, but he actually seemed to believe it. Um, that surprised me. Otherwise, you know, um, I found him intelligent and, and interested and very courteous to me, even though he was very rude about some other people. Um, so I found him a fascinating character. Thank you. Um, by the way, that was a, should have been attributed to Richard Young, that question, so there was an error there. Um, 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 uh, yeah, something I was going to ask you, let me read out what I wrote previously. You could argue that the Brexit vote was because of many disparate viewpoints all combining to express their dissatisfaction with one choice. Um, a significant factor in my opinion anyway, but not the biggest, was that the EU organisation was portrayed as so bad, corrupt, wasting uh, money, power grabbing, undemocratic. And anybody who knows anything about it knows each one of those is rather untrue. Now, I, I do remember you saying it's, it's, it's emotions. You've got to get hold of people's emotions, not the, the, the logic and facts and figures often just wash over them. I remember you saying that to me. I agree with you rather more than I than I did at the time. But anyway, should we be trying to portray the EU as 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 something more benevolent compared to how the Brexit has portrayed it? In a sense, the the um, Ukraine business is already doing that, isn't it? Yeah. So. Um... Basically, when it comes to politics, the first, the first question is, who's got my back? Um, and people don't usually express it like that. They don't usually think about it too much. But before you analyse any situation, you tend to view it through a prism of who you trust and who you don't trust and that who you trust and who you don't trust comes down to who has the same values as me and who cares about me versus who doesn't have the same values about me and doesn't care about me and the easy thing to do with the eu was it's way over there i don't know it i know it takes money and gives out laws right that doesn't sound like a friendly entity on my side when when phrased uh, like that so with the eu it's always come down to well does the eu have anyone's back is it is it just a bunch of politicians that were has-beens in their own countries siphoning up new money in order to sit around and have comfortable meals and make laws in which case whose back does it really have there you've you've got to say what have these laws protected what would happen otherwise when you get to situations for example like this government has wanted to dump feces in rivers and because of rules that we've agreed to with the EU, the European Court of Justice sits there and our public can go to the European Court of Justice and say, they're dumping this in my rivers. They signed an international agreement. They shouldn't do that. Can I take my government to you, that court? And that court goes, yes. Then you know what that structure of the EU is for. You know it's got the back of local people. You know it's got the back 
of campaigning groups that are trying to keep our country, our beaches, our air and our rivers clean. Um, similarly, uh, when you think about the UK steel industry, you know, all these stories that, that, that the EU gutted it, and there's some reasons why those stories came about. But then if you give them the example, well, hold on a sec, back when George W. Bush was in power, um, he put up um, tariffs um, against UK steel. And some of our best steel productions, really high grade steel, was on the line. And Tony Blair at the time was trying to be all smooth Tony and, you know, will you, will you take these, will you take these away? And, and they said no. Um, and then the EU got involved because we were part of the EU's market, we were all part of the EU, and said to George W. Bush, if you don't remove the tariffs on that steel, we will put up tariffs on Florida oranges. And George W. Bush's brother, Jeb Bush, was in Florida, the main export to Europe was oranges, and Jeb Bush was coming up for a re-election and it was on a knife edge. And the last thing you'd want is your oranges business in Florida going bust at that point. And then George W. Bush capitulated. The EU had British steelmakers backs. And now you see it again that Ukraine, we can see who Ukraine are taking on. We see what Putin's behaving like. Who's got their back? Well, the US does, the UK does, and the EU does. But the UK, even though we gave plenty of weapons early, you know, what are we doing now with the oligarchs? Not much. What are we doing with taking in refugees? Not much. Uh, we haven't, the EU, by comparison, has absolutely stepped forward and it has Ukraine's back. And everyone can see that. And everyone can see that that is principled. So, in all these political arguments, there's always going to be so much information and so much data that you can spin any argumentation to your philosophical preference. You know, people don't make decisions in this world via the data lying around. They don't pick it up and then, because of the data, make a decision. People walk around with their naked philosophies, but they're very uncomfortable that they're naked with these philosophies. So they go around looking for data to dress their philosophies in, and they always can. So you have to start with the basic philosophies of what this is all about in its spirit. And so it is the spirit of being European, and it is the spirit of the EU, and who it protects, and who it fights for, and why, and what it does for our future, that are always the starting points in, in any of these discussions. And then, you know, data and analysis can come later. But, you know, proof of spirit is the thing that we're looking for here. Mike, um, taking stock, um, a subject we haven't really discussed, but I have some questions on it, is the European movement. So would it be easier if I just asked you to sort of briefly hold forth about the priorities that might be of interest to us? Is that good enough or will I dive into yeah, questions? Because no, that's, that's, it's getting fine. near to zero yep. time. I, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm happy to go a bit over as well if for anyone who wants to stick around. Um, European movement. Um, I have now joined the European Movement um, part-time as an advisor on strategy and campaigning. Um, I had proposed to European Movement that we do a joint project in, on, uh, with Scientists for EU and European Movement on science and the threats and risks there. Um, but then I basically got invited into a position, which I, which I agreed to quite enthusiastically, actually. And that's because um, in 2019, when everything sort of um, fell apart with that election, after that, I thought, what are we going to do with our great community around the country? You know, all of these local groups, all the network that this is. Um, I had no leverage on the European movement at that time. I, I didn't like some of the people in it. Um, and, and I thought that the, the chair at the time, um, was 
was absolutely lazy. And I didn't know if European movement would be able to make an effective job of, of make, keeping alive this, this fantastic grassroots network that we have. And I didn't know if the Grassroots for Europe would step in. I didn't know what was going to happen. And so I set up the Bylines Network in order to try and harvest some of the best people that I've been working with into adding a new layer on top of our social media, which was the, which was the local news. However, by the time it got to the end of last year, uh, 2021, I thought the European movement had gotten itself into a good place. Um, because the membership had grown, um, it, it had good, solid, regular funding. Um, it had managed to keep the structure of the um, grassroots uh, very vibrant, and there was no other groups doing it on that same local groups level. And it had reorganized its internal heavy bureaucracy um, in order to develop something that works better. So I thought all in all, it had gotten itself into a better shape and brought in new people that, that understood it better. Andrew Adonis, I was skeptical at first of, of coming in into the chair position because um, he can be a bit of a loose cannon on Twitter, for example. <laughs> However, um, he was very good getting involved with the grassroots and sorting out the whole structure of the thing and that is something that for example in Dominic Grieve would would not have done. Dominic Grieve is a great external um, ambassador and voice so I think the structure is actually good um, and because this is a long build now I think the European movement has got the right ideas uh, about where it's going and that is to strengthen at the grassroots level so um, investment actually going down into um, a lot of uh, local projects around linking up with local businesses or pursuing local initiatives. Um, partnerships with campaigns such as uh, Save British Farming, which I'm, I'm helping develop at the moment, means that you can have more kinds of demos with lots of different flavors going on. Um, I think there's some partnerships structurally with, with the bylines network, just in terms of lots of the characters involved. And this whole plan of step by step rebuilding uh, towards um, Europe and, and the EU is a good one. And it's being done at the right pace. And there's good focus on what the actual mission is. Uh, rather than being distracted by policing bill here or another bill there. Um, I think it's building a, a good, clear focus. I think some people are frustrated that it hasn't been as loud and campaigny um, over the last, you know, uh, since the pandemic has been dying down. But from what I can see on the inside is a campaign that is growing in capacity internally, um, crystallizing its structure and building good foundations for, for going forward. I think at the end of the day, we're going to need a Roman army to get back to where we need to get back to. A good Roman army needs a lot of organization and training and a good hub of Rome in order to guide it. And as we all know, Rome wasn't built in a day. Um, but I think from my impression is that the construction of Rome uh, at the heart of the European mo movement at the moment is a good one. I sometimes feel a bit frustrated because I'd like to see more money invested in overt campaigning and so forth and so on. But I think just in terms of its robust capacity to, to grow that membership, to take on more staff, to expand that organogram, to, it's collecting policy papers at the moment, and I'm involved with writing some of them on whether it's um, Erasmus Plus, Horizon, uh, school exchanges, farming, you know, all of these are going to come through, going to then get converted into uh, brochures and flyers that can get tested on local groups uh, or tested via local groups. You can then at a later stage send some of those out in direct mailing to hit different demographics. I think it's all starting to get lined up properly. That's that's my summary. That's my impression. Thank you, Mike. Um, this this may or may not be a good ending point, um, but I, I and many 
others far cleverer than me um, think that it would be great if we could get some sort of progressive alliance, a gathering of non, I mean, I voted Tory in the past, but this is not a very nice Tory party. If we could get rid of this lot for the moment, um, you could call them progressive alliance or you could not give them a name at all. You, they could bring in PR, a written constitution maybe, state funding of the political parties, um, according to a formula, something like that, and make a better use of the House of Lords. Things like that seem to me to be such a desirable improvement. Is that a, a, a hopeless pipe dream, do you think? No, I, th I think it's, it's absolutely where we need to go. I think the next general election, you do need um, a collaborative effort on getting this Conservative Party under Boris Johnson out or, or whoever his successor is. Um, it's, it's got a lot of uh, bad apples in there. It is going to take uh, Labour and the Lib Dems and Greens and possibly SNP um, working together at some level in order to achieve that um, because of certain dynamics stacked against them by first past the post and funding rules and all those other little games being played. Um, <clears throat> and I do think there is place for an overhaul of the, the House of Lords um, and um, the, the voting system per se. And I think probably Labour's smartest play coming up to the next general election would be an offer um, of some movement towards um, PR or something like it so that voters from other parties could all pile in behind uh, Labour for the most part, apart from where it could be clearly won by Greens or Lib Dems or you know, SNP. And then at the other side of that election, should you win it, then with the new PR system, um, it opens up the, the representations of the other parties and means that going forward, Conservative parties, should they ever wish to hold power again, um, cannot do so by being crazies on 40%. Uh, they just can't. So I think that's a sensible game plan. Now, is that a game plan for European movement? No. Um, I think European movement needs to focus on European movement um, and our relationship with the EU. Um, but all members of European movement and local pro-EU groups and anyone else that cares like I care should also get involved with Make Votes Matter and other campaigns like that that can help drive this change. So I think you should not be demanding of European movement that it gets involved with campaigning around other issues. I think you should recognise that, that what we need in order to make change in this country is an ecosystem of campaigns all taking up their different roles. You know, here are the archers, here are the pike men, here's the cavalry, everyone knows what their own roles and targets are. Everyone understands that those roles are enhanced by other people going off uh, and doing their job on their focus. So <clears throat> I think that um, that's how it should all break down. But yes, we, we definitely need that happening as well. Thank you, Mike. I've seen someone put in the chat, you do want to, you do want to, but that, but that needs to be done by campaigns dedicated to work on that, like Best for Britain really is going hard on that. So everyone that cares about that, we should all care about that, should be swinging in behind um, the efforts of, of those campaigns um, that are, are trying to take that on. Um, so there's, there's a whole load of campaigns out there. Um, and so as individuals, we all should be, but if we were to ask, all our different campaigning organizations to hop over here, then hop over there, then hop here, then hop there, then we are like archers and pikemen running into each other um, rather than everyone keeping disciplined about what different campaigning organizations are targeting. Thank you. Um, I was seeing comments about European movements and, and wanting to see it more 
more prominent in the media and so forth and so on. Yes. And I'm very aware of, of that sentiment, uh, you know, uh, existing in quite a lot of places. One of my new roles is actually coming out and giving more talks to start engaging different groups as well. I've, I've been tasked with that. But um, absolutely right. One of the things that needs to happen is a European movement to start getting out more polling into the press, more commentary into the press. Um, mm. And and I think as, as membership increases and more money comes in, it will actually have more advertising money in order to push itself out on Twitter and Facebook. So um, we've got Jack Dart running the social media now and starting to do those adverts for the European movement. So that's starting to build that up as well. Um, but at some point we need to start getting louder again with our commentary. We just need to make sure that all the policy aspects are lined up before we get going in. And so that's why it's at that frustrating stage at the moment. And the media is, is a problem, is it not, Mike? A difficult hurdle to get past. Just, just to finish off, um, I remember that um, during the Britain Strong and Europe campaign and during the People's Vote campaign, they were both dominated by media people um, that thought that getting headlines was everything. I, I remember even uh, the ex-People's Vote people in the general election of 2019 had that big event with John Major where John Major said, don't vote Tory. And they were delighted that it got on the front page of stuff. I would suggest very respectfully that that did not shift one bean in the red wall. So um, do not be, do not fall into the same trap of the false sucker of seeing uh, opinions that you like massaging your eyes from the pages of, of newspapers, um, from uh, organizations that you know. The actual real work on conversion in terms of people's opinions happens at the cold face of society day in, day out. And so you, you see a lot more shifts happening within, for example, rural communities around issues of farming and food quality um, that aren't badged with European movement or anything, but we have been involved in initiating a lot of those conversations, those talks, those demos and things like that. So um, that's where I have more interest, but I, I think that also at some point, you do need that media prominence um, in order to have that call out card for more members and in order to provoke the enemy to come at you in big debate. Um, but that is only part of it. There's lots and lots of groundwork that needs to happen that will actually do more to shift polls than, than you know, big sounding stuff on the broadsheets. Yes, but what about those marches, Mike, which hardly got mentioned, but, but because we were all walking down roads in London and blocking them and things, they did get mentioned almost reluctantly. And we got more, more prominence in Europe than in the, the, some of the, our main media, I thought. However, I, I understand the point did, you made. Those marches didn't, I don't believe, shift public opinion. However, they did shift parliament. Our focus at the time was absolutely on parliament. Uh, parliament, which was as divided as the country was divided, we were showing that Parliament was indeed representative and so it was okay for some of those politicians that were very nervous about challenging Brexit to actually keep going on and challenging Brexit. And as we got into just before the, the general election of 2019, we actually had enough parliamentarians that, that would have uh, forced a, a, you know, a people's vote on if the Lib Dems hadn't sort of <laughs> broken ranks and then Labour capitulated behind it. And, and in fact, there was a whole there was a whole time where we could have had a, a, a government of national unity. But Jeremy Corbyn would actually not let go of the fact that if we were going to have that, then it had to be him at the head of that. But then, of course, that would. I, I don't want to go back there, but um, different shows of strength achieve different things and what a lot of people didn't realize was those people vote marches they were actually about 
the numbers in Parliament one by one, reassuring them that this battle was live and they could do it. I think Joe has had a hand up for quite a long time. Cool. And uh, thank you for everything you do and all the energy you put into it. Um, can I put in a plug for, for the, the round table? Um, it's an idea that we've had for the last two years to try and bring together all the pro-European um, voices that didn't get together before 2019, before the general election. And I want to put a plug in because we've, we, we realise that being pro-European isn't enough. We need also to become um, pro-civil society. And we found that all the edges are coming together and that we can support each other through the round table. Um, you know, the, the, the backdrop behind me. Through the round table, we're bringing together um, in collaboration, groups like Liberty Make Votes Matter, plus, you know, another Europe is possible, plus the European movement. We have over 20 participating uh, groups. We want to build on that. And we hope that we can all together be that missing voice that can start saying there, is a, there are ways forward. We are pro-Europeans. We are Europeans and we want to be part of the European firmament that's dealing with climate change, that's dealing with, with all sorts of things like that. So if I can just say, take heart. There's lots of us in the background trying to do all the things that Mike has been saying. 